is the anchor we carry on our bow. B is the bowsprit that leads us along. C is the crab winch that merrily goes round. And D are the davits that let our boat down. So a hundred years ago, this was a common sight throughout the Thames estuary. More than 2,000 Thames sailing barges moved goods around the coast of England. Now only 31 of these workhorses remain in sailing condition and seven of them are here today at the annual South End Barge Match. Race organiser and officer of the day is Grant Lippler. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, hop. <laughs> The Thames barge matches started in 1863, making this the second oldest sailing competition in the world. Today, tourists and locals alike are making their way to the end of South End Pier to watch the old barges race and get a whiff of a bygone age. The light winds are already giving Grant Littler a headache. So we've got seven barges. And we're doing a short course because, uh, as you can see, it's not very windy today. The South End match is uh, quite a special match because you can see the barges throughout the match. They may be some way away, but you can see them all. And that's a really good spectator situation. And, and I think it is something that um, people like to see, especially in South End. The locals come down to see this barge match. The barges will be going towards the Lee Low Way and then they're off to the West North Sand, uh, which is across the river, and then up to the West Lee Middle and back home. These barge matches started 140 years ago with a real commercial purpose to improve the sail handling and speed of the boats. In a good breeze, a well sailed barge can make very good progress. The barges were very fast and they were keen to race and the best barges used to get the best cargoes. The business could expect if you came first in a barge match to get much more cargo than other barges and this was a bonus to, to them. <laughs> the, the barge matches these days are competitive but they're also very there's a great camaraderie between the barge crews. It's not a Formula One race, this. We're not talking about the Michael Schumachers of this world. We're talking about guys that are very keen on restoring and keeping these barges going and, and having a good time. But they, of course, still like to win. They do like to win. The sailing barge Adieu is one of the favourites to win in her class and the competition is intense. Today she's got 12 people on board, but traditionally these boats were crewed by no more than two men and a boy. They evolved from flat bottom barges used on the Thames estuary in the 17th and 18th centuries. These were literally floating wooden boxes. Over the years the boats got bigger and they were rigged with sails modelled on Dutch barges. By the 1890s, the Thames sailing barge was at its peak and the biggest boats traded across the North Sea to the continent and voyages as far as Cornwall were common. In Whitstable Harbour, the barge Greeter has been converted into a home by owner Steve Norris. During its trading days, the crew's quarters would have been much smaller than they are today. Um, originally, she started off with three crew, a skipper and a mate and a boy. So the skipper and mate would have lived down aft in the, uh, where the engine room is now and the um, boy would have been up forward and I suppose it was his job to make the tea and get the stove going and cook the dinner and that. This cosy cabin is the only corner of the barge the crew could call their own. It's their saloon, their dining room, their sleeping quarters and all. They don't talk much after the long day but what tales the skipper could tell if he chose. A hot meal and a cosy stove was sometimes a luxury in those days, as former barge skipper Stan Yates recalls. We, we never had any problems over eating, you know, we ate when we could and, and when we couldn't, that was it. And of course there were times when 
you've been learning wind bound for a long while, you ran out of grub, just that simple. Or you ran out of water. Compared with today, it was a hard life. They were able to sail with just the two or three crew because all the hard work was done by winches that are placed around the deck. It was still hard work, but in comparison to older type of vessels, it took a lot of the physical work out of what they had to do. Um, you had winch power instead of manpower. The rig of the Thames barge is a spritsail rig. It's uh, originated over in Holland. Um, the beauty of it was you was able to set the topsail without setting the mainsail on the old type bar on the older craft, the gaff rig ones that came before this, they used to have a gaff that you used to have to pull up and down. And because of the size of the gaff, it needed a fa fairly big crew to pull it up. But with the sprit, the mainsail's there and it just all comes, falls out, and it's worked off a, a winch the other side to do the hard work. Another special feature of the Thames sailing barge was its flat bottom. This allowed the boat to sail up shallow creeks and rivers throughout the east coast. Well, the limits were roughly from Dover to uh, Yarmouth um, and all ports in between, really. We used to go where the bigger coasters or ships couldn't go. They got extra money for going up through the bridges um, and also they could get a tow, but some of them wouldn't tow up because that cost more money. And in them days, a lot of the time didn't really matter. So, you know, they'd rather spend an extra couple of three days taking the barge through on their own and save the towage money. And regards, um, you know, what today was like, there's so many factors that would govern it. The tides, the times, the weather. Back in South End, the weather's giving the barge crews problems. <coughs> The crew of the Adieu is trying to use every last breath of wind to coach the boat through the water. Come on, Adieu. He's got a head in there, look. And you don't know what the weather's going to give you. I mean, it's got to give us something better than this to get round. Skipper Jimmy Lawrence is familiar with fickle weather from his days as a working bargeman. You did have to learn to be patient because you, you could lay and hold up for several days and couldn't do nothing. But then when the weather did come right, you had to really go at it and catch up as much time as you could. Mainly we used to sail to London empty, mostly, and then pick up our cargo in London, which might be Canadian wheat, imported stuff, and take it to the East Anglian mills. There we used to take wheat, and we used to do a lot of timber work. And with timber, of course, we did big stacks on deck. There was uh, malt and barley, maize, cattle feeds. Another thing we had was cosytos, that was uh, like what your cornflakes are like today, and that was in sacks. <laughs> that was flaked, flaked maize called cosytos. So we did a lot of funny cargoes. Even as late as the 1960s, sailing barges were a familiar sight throughout the tidal Thames. Because their masts were designed to be easily lowered, they could pass under bridges in central London and go upstream as far as Battersea, Fulham and Isleworth. The barges were also a common sight around the London docks. I mean, the way the whole thing was organised was um, a ship, say, coming from Australia or Canada with wheat, and you went to a ship to pick up a parcel or share a parcel with another barge or maybe four or five barges for that parcel or for one miller. And all the millers are spread up, up and down the east coast, almost everywhere. Even in trade, we, we didn't get a weekly wage. We was, we was working on a share basis of the cargo, so that was important to beat your opponent. And so we used to race for turn, as they called it. So the first one to get to London would get the first freight. So you were racing all the time. But that was a friendly competitiveness. I don't think there was any anger in it. I think the method of squaring up was very, very fair because um, the owner used to take 50% and the crew would take 50%. So say, for instance, you, um, you grossed 60 or netted 60 pounds, the owner would take 30 pounds, the skipper would take 20 and the mate would take 10. It might be a glorious bank holiday weekend, 
but the barges are barely moving and Grant Littler has problems. I don't think we're going to get all the barges round. How are you doing? The tide is, the tide is almost spent and um, I'm not quite sure what to do with the others. The trouble is there's no bloody wind, is there? Although there's some cloud coming up which might change things a bit. With the wind so light, there's even a chance that some of the barges won't make it back to the finish. A bit more. That's good. Pull her in a little bit. We're just thinking whether we're going to get the, yeah, get the barges to the West North Sand, let alone get them round. Because um, once the tide turns, they're going to, with no wind, they're going to start floating backwards. The South End barge match is in trouble. The light wind means that the boats are struggling to get round the course. Now the tide has turned against them and they might not get back at all. We're turning everybody at the West North Sand back to the Lee Low Way. Did you get that? When they're not racing, most of these old barges still have to earn their living. In Winstable in Kent, the 112-year-old barge greeter is being prepared for a charter trip by owner-skipper Steve Norris. Greeter's my home, that's the main reason I got her. Thames sailing barges have a huge amount of space in what used to be the ship's cargo hold, and the area is usually converted into snug living quarters for the owner, with every home comfort. But these boats are expensive to maintain, and they have to pay their way. Then I started doing the chartering, which is what most of the barges do nowadays. There's not many about now that are actually lived on and chartered at the same time. If you get people come along, some just want to sit down and relax, and other people like to have a go at sailing. We're getting all sorts come along. We get people from yacht clubs want to come along because they've seen barges but never sailed on them. We're still getting people coming on because they just want to go out and see the faults. She was built in 1892 by a company called Stones at Brightling Sea. She's one of the older ones going now. I think she's about the third oldest one that's sailing. She used to trade regular between Colchester and London. And Greta, she would have, uh, she was work, working for seed crushers up at Colchester, I mean Parry. So she would go up to London, load up the linseed, um, bring them up to Colchester. They used to all be crushed down, they used to get the oil out of it to make the varnishes and lacquers and then load it back in barrels in the barge and then take them back to London to be exported. The, la the last time she actually carried a cargo would have been the late 50s. Right. Just call it down there. Greta is typical of the demise of the working barge. The late 1950s and early 1960s saw the introduction of shipping containers and reliable diesel road transport and this consigned the working Thames sailing barge to history. As the barges began to be laid up, a handful of enthusiasts saw a way to keep the spirit of the sailing barge alive and give them a new lease of life. The holds were converted into basic cabins and these old boats were again under sail, taking people on weekend charters in place of the cargo they'd previously carried. For Steve Norris, renovating Greta has been a labour of love, which has taken years to complete. Pull the slack in then. Well, I died. Today, his sailing barge is both a comfortable home and a successful oh, charter Martin. business. Hang on. No, Martin, up that way. But the last job she was doing was um, doing beer from Nine Elms round to Chatham. Oh, yeah, it's a uh, so, foreign there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah that, that rang a bell with me, because my uncle used to have a, an off-licence, I remember. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they keep, they, um, 
that's when this was a motor barge. Uh, but they yeah. kept they kept that on the trade because the mate and the uh, and the skipper they were teetotal. <laughs> so the customs yeah, so the customs kept them on. They didn't have any worries. Yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah. At the end of the uh, 19th century, there was about two and a half thousand barges going then, um, all in sort of various states of. Some were very old and on their last legs, and others were just coming out. But nowadays, there's a, possibly, I think, about 20 that could go sailing. There's a few more that are being restored. Some will make it, some won't. But there's, uh, compared to what there was, there's very few left now. Enthusiasts are still lovingly restoring some of the older barges. Ian Raffles and his girlfriend, Rachel, recently bought the Oak. We came down to Dolphin to look at another barge, and we both fell in love with this one. We bought the barge to restore it, and at the end of the day, it's going to be our house. This barge is the oldest surviving barge at the moment, built in 1881. Not done too bad since 1881. We've um, got to do a, replace about 90% of the barge. Um, about 90% is rotten. Um, the oak is built of wood. Um, she's 82 foot long. She would have had a Thames spritzel rig on her. Um, same as the other barges I've got at the moment. It takes so long to rebuild the barge because we're doing it in our spare time because we have to go to work to earn the money to pay for it. So that's why it's going to take about 10 years. Well, it'd probably be between 70 and 100,000 pounds to do it all. Maybe a bit more. We've got a few old photographs. Um, they're, they're all in black and white, but we'll get it to near, near as original as possible. Yeah, she's been under water quite a lot. We've got all the mud out now, or near all the mud. Um, it was up to the top of the level of the floors, right through the barge. There was a lot of mud down here. Luckily, we had a few friends come down and help us get it all out. It took us four, well, three days to do it, and um, a lot of buckets of mud. She likes being a submarine. Yeah, Rach comes down here when I'm at work and potters around and does bits and pieces, um, painting and things just to keep her looking smart. And... When the oak was built in the 1880s, Barge construction was at its peak, and the launch was an important event for the whole community. A whole industry supported the barges, including shipwrights and sailmakers. When the sail is ready, it's taken out into the yard to receive its traditional red colouring. This consists of a mixture of cod oil, red ochre, horse fat, and sea water. What a mixture. Uh, this has, as might be expected, a smell all of its own. The dressing has the virtue of never drying completely, which keeps the sails both waterproof and supple, and so much easier to handle at sea. And it will be some time before Ian's barge is ready for new sails. As you can see, the deck's collapsing and um, all needs replacing. Most of it's safe, you can walk around on it at the moment, but there's a few holes under a few bits of ply. Have to be careful of. These old boats are unique and they've all got their own individual histories and it's just nice to keep them all going. It's not like the modern production yacht where you can see one and know the next 20 are going to be the same. Well, we hope to be sailing in about 10 years and hopefully we'll be able to run it as a charter business. It seems like a lifetime away yet, but we'll get there. Steve Norris is now taking Greta back to her home port of Whitstable. With me and Greta, it's more of a labour of love. I'm never going to retire on what I make on her, but you know, they are just a fascinating vessel to, to be about on. But I don't want. Well, the heyday of the barge was the um, sort of Victorian era. 
Um, I say that's when they reckon it was probably about two and a half thousand of them about. But it was a gradual decline after that. As soon as the engine started coming in, and then pe you know, people were getting more worried about time, um, it was more reliable to get from A to B under engine than it was under sail. But it's after the Second World War, that's when lorries started coming into their own. And a barge like Greta, if we wanted to go from here to London with a cargo, it could take us two days or two weeks. Whereas they know that if they put it on a lorry, they'd all be up there in two hours at the most. Um, and it's just, you know, like everything else these days, it's time it has to be there yesterday and not tomorrow. And at last, the South End barge race is coming to a close and the first barge is about to cross the finishing line. It's um, 1.52 exactly. And the adieu, she's made a respectable second place. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to come to the presenting the prizes. Second in Class A, of course, the adieu. Jimmy Lawrence collects yet another trophy to add to his mantelpiece, and the prize-giving ceremony brings the 41st South End Barge match to a close. But the barges will all be back next year to bring a timely reminder of a bygone age to the rivers of the Thames estuary tugboat collects a sand barge on the river at Battersea. Rick Bullock is skipper of one of a few working vessels we now see upstream of the Tower of London. For centuries these riverbanks were lined with busy wharfs importing cargoes from all over the world. Now the cranes and warehouses have been replaced by luxury apartments and office blocks, built with the very sand brought up river in barges like these. As we sail down river, we'll travel for an extraordinary 200-year history of boom and bust in London's Docklands. Not only is London the greatest metropolis of the world, but also, and above all, it is a great seaport, a marine city whose main channels, tributaries and backwaters are crammed with traffic. Traffic that passes to and from the open sea, and through one of the most up-to-date dock systems in the world. In the 1930s, the Port of London was in its heyday, the greatest port at the heart of the greatest empire the world has ever seen. From the Tower of London to the mouth of the river, an almost continuous line of docks and wharves stretch along both sides of the river. The port employed an estimated 100,000 people and many thousands more in warehouses and factories beyond. Few people would have believed that within a few years this great empire would have crumbled and the docks would be lying derelict and empty. Rick Bullock has worked on the river for 50 years. I was apprenticed to my father, he was apprenticed to his father, as it went, and so on. All the family worked on the rivers. I've been here ever since, when I was apprenticed, all the docks was working. Uh, full up with ships and barges, uh, gradually started moving down river, so... I mean, there used to be something like 300 tugs on the River Thames at one particular time. Now you'd be lucky to count 30. 200 years ago, ships arriving in the city unloaded their cargoes onto a handful of wharfs just downstream of London Bridge. This was one of the busiest places in London, and it was called the Legal Keys. The port became full to bursting point. Ships waited for months to unload, and a fifth of all imported goods were stolen or pilfered from the legal keys. Curator at the museum in Docklands is Tom Wareham. The legal keys were always very open to visitors. It would have been alive with activity. 
you have customs officers, you've got the lumpers and the porters, you've got sailors. You've got um, the sort of bows of London basically coming down to see what's going on, and we've got visitors arriving from France and all sorts of people. I mean, it was a very much an open world, um, hence it was open to theft. In response to this first crisis in London's Docklands, nine huge docks were built in the first half of the 19th century. These new docks dramatically increased the capacity of the port and also cut down on theft. They were mammoth feats of Victorian engineering and they've been compared in scale to the building of the Great Pyramids of ancient Egypt. The Victorian entrepreneurs took great pride in their docks, but all was not well and huge fortunes were about to be made and lost. The first dock to be built was the West India. We're standing on the, the north quay of the West India docks. This is the import dock built around 1802 to take the, the commodities of the West Indies trade. If you look opposite, you can see the, the towers of the Canary Wharf development, but on this side of the dock, we've got the, the original Georgian warehouses, which were built in 1802 to take the sugar, rum and coffee coming from the, the slave plantations of the West Indies. Originally, there were nine of these buildings stretching all the way along the north side of the quay. Um, a huge industrial and commercial development, unprecedented for its time. So originally when this was built it would have been lined with uh, square rigged sailing ships, the West Indiamen that came back across from the Caribbean carrying the, the riches of the slave plantations. One of the characteristics of dock work really from the 18th century onwards was underemployment and casual work. Dock work was always hard. Um, it was known for being tough, very dangerous work throughout its history. It was one of the major occupations where accidents occurred and people became injured. These men first started working in the Surrey commercial docks just after the Second World War. But little had changed and dock work still had a reputation for being very tough work. It was a very dangerous job. Yeah. Little Spud Murphy from up Depth and Broadway. A reel of paper crushed him right against the yeah. bulwark. I was only in the dock three weeks when that happened. That was on the older barrel. The dual porter carried timber from the barges onto the quay, where it was stacked according to its size. Uh, there's not much more than that to it, except it was extremely hard work. We had to all cut work, a plank of wood, no wider than what you was carrying on your shoulders. When you work it out on a loading, loading sugar job, one single man would have had about 50 tonne of sugar on his back in a day, which sounds impossible, but he would have had, but he'd be backing it in and underneath and all that. The main cargoes coming into this dock were sugar, rum and coffee. The sugar, when it comes in, is actually in a semi-raw state. It comes in in sacks, it's very granular, and as the men carried it, the, the grains worked through their clothing and cut their hands and their shoulders in particular. So the area in front of these warehouses actually became known as Blood Alley because of the blood that soaked through the men's clothing from handling the sugar. Work in the docks was always hard and dangerous, and from the late 1800s, the labourers began to organise themselves into unions to demand better wages and better working conditions. You've stunk on your fish meal for weeks. On your clothes, you imagine, fish meal, rotten fish, used to come over as a fertiliser. And then I told you, sulphur. When you worked on sulphur, bagging sulphur, it used to get in your eyes that they just keep watering. You couldn't go to the cinema or nothing. And the first problem, asbestos, was in this stock because we used to load it. We used to load it raw, raw, raw asbestos. You didn't know what job you were going to go on until you got there. No, so you could be wearing something like this. Yeah, there was no protective clothing issued at that particular period. It wasn't None until the mid-70s. Before then, nothing. Dockers were traditionally employed on a casual basis, and labourers never knew what work might be available. Men would actually wait outside the dock gates to see if there was any employment. There was a system called the call-on, um, which was a very barbaric system, basically, where men fought for jobs in a particular dock. And if they were lucky to get taken on, there was no guarantee that there would be work for more than an hour. 
uh, in which, at which point they could be laid off and then they couldn't get anywhere else to be taken on for the rest of the day. Working conditions improved after the Second World War. However, the so-called coulomb was still a central feature of dock labour right up until the 1970s. In Docker's language, it was called shaping. My father would shape in the morning here, and if he didn't get it called off here, he would jump on an 82 bus through the tunnel or a lorry that was going that way and try and get called off at the mill wall or even down at the Albert docks or the Royal Group of docks. It was, um, that's our bad. And then, then there might not be nothing. Do they have buses waiting there to take you to yeah. other docks? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, oh, you could be about a fortnight with no work. In 1889, there's a dispute oh, yeah. in the South West India dock which quickly spread throughout the dock system and a major strike developed. In fact, it was the biggest industrial dispute Britain had ever seen. And they were striking for two things, really. They were striking for a minimum uh, period of employment each day, four hours, and an increase in pay from five pence to six pence an hour, what was known as the Dockers Tanner. This carries on for the, the best part of six weeks. And eventually, the strike ends with the Dockers getting their Tanner and their guaranteed minimum working day. The period of dock building during the first half of the 19th century brought new problems to the dock owners, and London's Docklands was about to face its first crisis. We have an oversupply of docks and warehouses, and the dock companies basically go into competition. They cut each other's throats, they amalgamate. Um, and by the end of the century, we, we've got you know, the greatest port in, effectively, the greatest empire in the world in a t state of total chaos. The creation of the Port of London Authority in 1909 effectively nationalised London's docks and brought a period of stability to the industry. By the 1930s, the docks were booming once again. Every kind of equipment is provided by the authority for receiving, moving or loading the millions of tonnes of goods which enter and leave the port every year. Butter, fruit, cheese and so on, urgent perishable goods. The number of key and warehouse trains in the docks is well over 1,500. By the end of the 1930s, the war in Europe brought another crisis to the docks. The 7th of September, 1940, is known as Black Saturday. The first raid started at four in the afternoon and the attack continued till dawn the next morning. London's docks were bombed every day for the next eight weeks. Yet despite constant attack, the docks kept going throughout the war. Peacetime brought new opportunities. London's docks rose from the ashes to become even bigger than ever. However, within a generation, Docklands faced a new threat that proved even more destructive than the Luftwaffe and would change the face of London forever. Rick Bullock and his crew are now well downstream and passing a very familiar London landmark. On the opposite side of the river here is a run-down stretch of the Thames with a very proud history. 30 years ago, this was the entrance to the magnificent Royal Docks. They were closed in 1981, but these docks were once packed with ships and provided work for thousands of labourers. They wake in Woolwich, Silvertown, Barking, Limehouse, Stepney and the Commercial Road, converging by bus, bicycle, tram, truck, train and finally on foot. Dockers, tallymen, checkers, stevedores, hatchmen, gangers, tractormen, coopers, bank riders, weyers, dock watchmen, dredgemen, launchmen, needlemen, jetty clerks, warehousemen, measurers, coal trimmers, lightermen, lumpers. And just as you think you've named them all, up goes a crane driver to his seat in the sky. <laughs> There was strict demarcation of labour in the docks. The men who loaded and unloaded the holds were called stevedores, and those who worked on the quayside were called dockers. The men took great pride in their work, and jobs were often passed down through several generations. My father was a stevedore, and my wife's father was a stevedore. It was a, quite a mingled thing, really. Both, both sides of my family, my mother's side and father's side, were all dock workers. My uncle, who was union man then, he, he's my father's brother, he got me into the docks. He said, you, I'd come home from sea, he said, you want your ticket? I said, yeah, I will try it. So for a while I went back in the dock, hung me ticket up, what we used to be able to do, and then went back to sea for a while. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was no apprenticeship. No, 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 but they all knew yeah. some women you found. Oh, you're so and so's boy, are you? I'll tell you about him, and you heard stories yeah. probably all day. He was a nonna. Yes. That's what he called you, a nonna, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Comradeship at work transferred into a strong attachment with the labour unions. Two major unions were established the Blue Union and the White Union. No, the only rivalry was the two coloured. The two cards. different unions, yeah. The National Mobile HC was a document, had a blue card. Transport in general had a white card, blue and white. I mean, what we don't like, what I don't like, and I'm sure all the boys do, we don't like it when they say we were lazy dockers, all we wanted to do was go on strike for money. The Blue Union never got a penny when they was out on strike, not a penny. No. I mean, most of us had families. No family allowance or nothing then, was there? No. No, no. no. no strike no. pay. sign on or anything like that. It's, uh... Well, you've got literally nothing. You've got literally got nothing. The Blue Union was was considered the rebel union. And out of the two, they was the best union of the lot, without a doubt. Without they a doubt. were the working union, yeah. the ones that done the work. Yeah. There were many skilled craftsmen employed in the docks, including coopers who made and repaired barrels. Before the days of shipping containers, the barrels were the most efficient way of transporting loose and liquid cargoes. John Ardley and his wife grew up in East Ham. He first started working as a cooper in the Royal Docks in 1954. He remembers the day his photograph was taken as a young man. Someone come down the vault and they wanted a picture of a cooper just Anyone driving, really. driving hoop on. I was lucky enough to get you. <laughs> and I, I happened to be there. <laughs> You've run down. <laughs> I've run down, yeah. Once the ship was emptied, the barrels, they would go in the shed. Any leakers, the cooper would stop. Any hoops missing, it would hoop up. Uh, then, when the customs was ready, they was put away in the vault until the merchant wants them, uh, and so on. Who was that? Then? Old Z, tobacco, come from Rhodesia, South Africa, well, America. You're weighing it there on this. Yeah, that's right. There. Yeah. If you had any commodities, orange juice, lime juice, animal skins, whatever. A python skins they are. Oh, <laughs> python skins. skins. The customs would want the head taken out, examine the goods for the tax purposes. Then we'd put the head back and that's what we would do. But I was always early bird, always at work by half past seven in the pub, go in the pub, meet a couple of coopers outside, have a drink, a couple of pints, and then start work, your day's work. Ah, oh, uh, sad of it. Mind you, it was a good job for yeah. dockers in there, really, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Is he hook, see, he's hook in his belt yeah. and docker. Yeah. Actually, during the day's work, we'd always have a, a little sample of different things. Most people was behind each other and helped each other out. Forklift trucks left behind by the Americans after the Second World War were soon put to work. As a result, these and other new technologies soon changed the face of the working docks. I don't think we ever thought the dock was going to finish. No. Regardless of what we could see or what we understood no. or visualised, we didn't think the docks was going to finish. Once containerisation came along, of course, the writing was on the wall. If you're going to bring in containers, for example, you need docks that are big enough to take container ships. You need docks with large open spaces around the water, around the basins, where you can park your containers, where you can actually move these things. The old dock systems that dated back to the early 19th century simply didn't have the potential for the new technology. So it's Tilbury that's got the wide open spaces that you need to actually handle this sort of technology. John Ardley was amazed when he first heard rumours of the docks closing. Well, when we heard London Dock was shutting, it was very scary, very scary. I mean, you, you've got a good job, safe, all of a sudden you could be out, get your redundancy or what, severance, and, you know, yeah, really scary. Yeah, we've got Money. what we call a severance. Severance, eh? Hey? It either suited you, you either go down Tilbury or take the money. And the last dock, really, was Tilbury, wasn't it? The Royals, Millwall, West India Dock, Surrey Dock, just disappeared within three years. Mm. 
I would like one of my family to have been in the dock and carried on the tradition. I mean, it's a few, few generations have been dock workers. But they did not consult us one iota. They just said, hey, oh, £35,000 or whatever it was, out. Between 1967 and 1981, all the major docks in London closed. The labour force fell from 50,000 to just 3,000 workers. Another 200,000 people working in related trades also lost their jobs. Rick Bullock and his crew have now reached the new Queen Elizabeth Bridge at Furrow, and it's the end of their journey. Like most cargoes today, the sand he takes on board is untouched by the hands of any dock worker. Meanwhile, a journey downstream through the history of London's Docklands continues on board a launch belonging to the Port of London Authority. Deputy Harbour Master at the PLA is Captain Ray Stanbrook. So we're just off the entrance to Tilbury Dock. The imports to Tilbury are, are many and various, ranging from forest products through to motor cars. Containers are particularly good because they are an efficient way of moving uh, commodities around the world. They can be loaded at the point of manufacture or uh, wherever uh, the customer needs to load the thing. It's then secure uh, all the way uh, on its journey uh, to its final destination where it can be delivered by lorry to the receiver. So uh, it's an absolutely ideal way of transporting goods. We're just passing in sight of the Shellhaven refinery. Uh, we have two operational berths here at the moment which uh, import bitumen and aviation fuel. Most shipping activity in the Thames is now centred downstream of Tilbury Docks, which was sold to a private company back in the 1990s. Today we've come full circle and we're back to the same situation 150 years ago, when all London docks were privately owned. The actual volume of trade through the Port of London last year was in the region of 51 million tonnes, which when you consider the heyday of the port uh, back 1950s, 1960s, it peaked at about 57 million tonnes. So although people are saying that the port is quieter than it ever was, the size of the ship that's increased enables us to keep this volume of trade up. Those things that happened in the past, particularly the activities of the docks in central London, which all go to uh, form a, a really useful basis uh, for future development and future activities for the port. I think we've got a, a really, really promising future coming to us. London's port is still booming, but few people see it now. Everything happens downstream, well away from the bustling heart of the city. But barrel maker John Ardley has regrets. Sad, actually. Yeah, I feel very sad. Yeah, I, I'm trying to hold on to the past, but, uh, you know, you can't. You, you can't. No, it's a shame. I mean, yeah. why it's bitter is because it's, uh, it's our families, our, our forebearers. Can you follow? It's our grandparents, our fathers, our mothers. It's the end of the historical period. Yes, yes. Yeah. History. There's an history here in this dock. Why do we have to go all over the place looking for history and putting statues up to great people? The great people in our lives was our forebearers. Our families have not been able to benefit from it, but I think my son's done better than he would have done if he'd have been in the dock. But the comradeship, and I don't know, they'd have had something, they'd have had something that we, we had lost. <laughs>